Now we're going to talk about various genres and just have kind of a brief overview of them. Now, a lot of these genres have already come up in our narrative, some of them more than once. So I'm not going to be going into extreme detail, um, not a comprehensive history or, or a listing, just a, just a survey. Um, so we'll go through this probably kind of quickly compared to uh, the things that we've just been talking about. And we're going to start with the Western genre. Um, by the way, full disclosure, uh, I am an author of, among other things, Western novels. My day job is professor, and my, my night job, I just make stuff up. Anyway, the Western... Um, has, uh, well, it's, it's, it's figured into our discussion from the very beginning because the Davy Crockett almanacs um, didn't have cowboys, but it was about the western, you know, western frontier of that time. And then that was followed, of course, by dime novels, which is primarily associated with uh, figures from the Old West. And then, you know, when, when pulp magazines replaced dime novels by around the turn of the century, um, there were uh, a lot of Western-themed, well, there were Western-themed magazines, but just the regular uh, anthology magazines frequently, the adventure magazines frequently had Western themes. Uh, and here I have some examples uh, of that. The Curse of Capistrano, starring... Zorro first appeared in All Story Weekly in 1919. Also first appearing in All Story Weekly, the author Max Brand, who would be one of the most uh, successful Western novelists of the first half of the 20th century. And as you can see on the far right, even Edgar Rice Burroughs sometimes left the jungle uh, and uh, went out west. Now, the next step in the development of comic books after Pulp Fiction was, of course, the comic strip, which developed around the same time as the Pulp Fiction. And in 1928, we saw the very first comic strip with a Western theme. Initially, it was called Young Buffalo Bill, but later changed to, to Bronco Bill, and that ran for, for many years. Um, in the 1930s, uh, several others appeared, and we've already looked at briefly um, when we were talking about Native American representation, two comic strips that started in 1938. One of them was The Lone Ranger, and the other one was this one, Red Rider, which uh, probably most of you listening have never heard of, but uh, was really big really big in the way back in the 20th century uh, started started off as as a comic strip and then uh, they started making movies uh, about Red Rider and his uh, his kid sidekick Native American kid sidekick Little Beaver who was played by the way by Robert Blake uh, who was also a member of the Little Rascals and then grew up to be Beretta and then grew up to be a part of a very sensational, uh, well, grew as he was uh, growing older, was part of a very sensational murder trial back in, I think, the 1990s. Anyway, um, comic books, of course, which reflected usually the popularity of the movies, more so than Red Rider as he appeared in the comic strips, and even, um, even attached the name Red Rider to the uh, Daisy Company's BB guns. So um, back in the uh, 1940s and 50s and 60s and 70s, every kid wanted a Red Rider BB gun. But watch out, kid. You'll put an eye out. Even Zane Gray got in on the Western comic strip. Uh, again, some of you may have never heard of Zane Gray. Um, he was the 
most successful and popular Western novelist of the first half of the 20th century. Louis L'Amour would uh, take that uh, position over in the second half of the 20th century. So it's entirely possible your grandpa has a big collection of Zane Grey novels along with his Louis L'Amour novels. So, uh, King of the Royal Mounted Police, written by Zane Grey and illustrated by, um, I'm not sure if there was one person throughout, but uh, Zane Grey was the big name, so that's the one they put on there. I doubt that he illustrated it himself. All right, well, then we get to the, uh, the birth of the comic books, which for the first couple of years, as you recall, were just reprinted comic strips. Uh, but then 1937, uh, the floodgates were opened uh, initially by Detective Comics Number 1, the first comic book with all original new material that had not been in a newspaper. And in that same year, 1937, there were at least three Western-themed comic books with new material that, that followed after Detective Comics Number 1. Uh, Western action thrillers there on the right, Star Ranger, which is the one that actually came first, and Western picture stories, which if, you, if you'll notice, issue number one there, um, among the stories that they advertise, is top hand by someone named Will Eisner. Well, I mentioned that... Um, it all started with Detective Comics number one, right, so far as brand new comics material. And, of course, Detective Comics was about detectives. Uh, there were several different series that ran in the book, starting with the first issue. And one of those detectives from Detective Comics number one was Buck Marshall, Range Detective, by Homer Fleming. So that's 1937. Well, what was the next really big comic book after Detective Comics? Uh, it was Action Comics in 1938, starring Superman, but then with several backup features as well, two of which were westerns. Uh, over on the right, once again, Homer Fleming uh, presents Chuck Dawson, and then Bernard Bailey uh, presented Tex Thompson. So uh, two westerns in that one. Then, uh, 1939, the first issue of Marvel Comics had five stories, five new characters. Well, Kazar wasn't really new. He was new to comics. Uh, but one of them was uh, The Masked Raider, which was a Western. So, Westerns were part of the fabric of comic books from the very beginning. 1948 was when the Western genre just really, really took off. There were a handful of Western-themed comics before then, but this became the new big thing with the decline of superheroes. So here we have several titles from different companies, all of which debuted in 1948. Now, we looked earlier when we were talking about where Marvel was in 1956 at the the many, many Westerns that they were putting out by then. So let's take a look, just a quick look at some of the people that we've already talked about and where they fit in with Westerns, including John Severin. As I, uh, as I mentioned, he's probably best known for his Westerns uh, and then after that his war comics at EC. And Jack Kirby, co-creator of Captain America, here he is with the uh, cover of Prize Western. <clears throat> well, Westerns weren't just popular in comic books. They were extremely popular at the movies. Uh, and that includes Western features, right, uh, that were like uh, full-length, two-hour movies with big movie stars that starred in other kinds of things, you know, like uh, Henry Fonda and James Stewart, and of course John Wayne. But there were also these things called uh, Saturday matinee movies. And this is, uh, I've mentioned this before, the practice was that 
<clears throat> on Saturday, well, Saturday afternoons, the tickets were cheaper and it was for, for kids. And they would have movie serials and things like that. And uh, by the late 40s, there were a number of stars of these things, many of them singing cowboys, although not all. And these, uh, these real life uh, people who were known for their Western serials, that's with an S, not a C, although I guess some of them may have been famous enough to have Western serials with a C. Anyway, uh, they also made it into the comics because their picture would sell magazines. And you've got the most famous of the singing cowboys, Gene Autry, who by 1948 wasn't only famous for his Western serials, but also for uh, writing songs like, uh, writing and performing songs like uh, Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer. So by 1946, he had his own comic that was ahead of the curve. These others all debuted between 1948 and 1950 or 51. And you've got uh, right there next to Gene Autry, the uh, number two biggest singing cowboy star, Roy Rogers. Now you'll notice that several of these are put out by Dell. Remember, they were really big on licensing things, uh, making comics from stuff that already uh, existed on the big screen and later on television. Um, several by Dell, although the Roy Rogers one, the Dell logo is a little different for some reason. Uh, but the ones that don't have the Dell logo on them up there, like uh, Ken Maynard, Lash LaRue, Monty Hale, uh, those were from Fawcett Publications. Remember, they're the ones that did the uh, Captain Marvel comics. Now, the last two on the bottom right uh, are, are interesting. Well, they're all interesting, but these last two are interesting for a different reason. Let's start with the Cisco Kid. We've talked about him. He, uh, when we were talking about uh, Latino uh, representation, uh, he was a Mexican-American cowboy who had been around. Actually, he had started uh, in the early 1900s in, uh, in prose. Um, but um, the first issue of the Cisco Kid from Bailey Publications came out in 1944, way ahead of this curve, and kind of withered on the vine. It just didn't do well at all, and it was canceled after the first issue. But then the big Western boom came, and the Cisco Kid was picked up. By this time, it had become a TV series, and it was picked up by Dell. And so uh, issue number one came out in 1944 by Bailey, and then Dell published issue number two seven years later in 1951, and then it ran for years and years. Now, the other one I wanted to uh, direct your attention to is Bob Colt, Western movie star. Now, I'm, I'm pretty sure that uh, most of you watching this don't know all these people. You may not know any of them. Some of you may have heard of Gene Autry or Roy Rogers, but uh, increasingly I find that uh, college students have never heard of them even. But um, I guarantee you haven't heard of Bob Colt, and that's because Bob Colt wasn't real. Um, that's by Fawcett Publications, and within a year or two, as Dell and Fawcett are competing to try to sign uh, the, the licenses from the various production companies to get the rights to these famous singing cowboys, and some of them not so famous singing cowboys, they ran out of singing cowboys. And so Fawcett hired a, a model and invented a famous singing cowboy uh, to put on the front of this book. And it ran for several issues, um, thinking that, you know, there's so many singing cowboys that the kids wouldn't, wouldn't know the difference. And um, Fawcett did this, but you know who did it uh, more than once was Timely. Uh, they just made up a bunch of different famous movie stars, like Tex Morgan, for example. Uh, to put on the front of their comics because, well, they weren't going to spend the money to license these things and share in the profits. So, hey, we'll just make up our own. Now, 
I think it would have been neat, uh, since he was so good at being the Black Rider, if all the uh, made-up Western stars had all been Stan Lee. Um, that's, that's, that's an interesting, uh, interesting thing to think about. Anyway, these comics were so popular, and the, uh, the Saturday afternoon matinee movies and serials were so popular that even the sidekicks got their own titles. Andy Devine uh, was a frequent sidekick to several uh, different uh, uh, cowboy series. And uh, Gabby Hayes, he was a sidekick, I think, to uh, Roy Rogers. Or was it Gene Autry? Anyway, he was he was famous as being a sidekick. He was the... You probably never heard of him, uh, unless you're my age or older. But he's kind of like uh, the crusty old prospector character uh, from the... Uh, uh, Toy Story, well, I think it was Toy Story 3. Anyway, whenever you see the crusty old prospector, uh, the the particular voice and everything that's being done is an imitation of Gabby Hayes. Now, my uncle was born, my mom's brother, was born in 1945 here in uh, Sparta, Tennessee, where I live. And he has told me about how the most exciting thing to happen in Sparta, Tennessee in the entire 1950s was when Gabby Hayes came to the movie theater and signed autographs. He was still telling stories about that 40 years later. Anyway, westerns got really big, 1948. You know what else got really big that we'll be talking about in, in, in a few minutes? Uh, romance comics. So, let's do the math. Western comics are big. Romance comics are big. Well, Western romance comics are just almost like a guarantee, right? So there were several of those specifically uh, geared toward romance stories with uh, cowboys and cowgirls. One of them, Saddle Romances, coming out uh, from EC Comics. You can see in the lower left uh, corner that the cover is by Al Feldstein. So this is one of the titles that EC canceled in 1950 when they decided to go with their new trend comics. Another one to look at, and this this shows up on a lot of uh, historians' lists of the best and or most important Western comics. Boys Ranch, featuring Clay Duncan which started in 1950 and was by the team of Simon and Kirby, Joe Simon and Jack Kirby. Uh, those are the guys who co-created Captain America and uh, various uh, worked on various different things, left the Marvel to go to D.C., remember that. Um, 1950, uh, 10 years almost since Captain America, and Jack Kirby's art style had evolved in that time. If you look at the old Captain America comics, uh, the, the, the line work and everything is very kind of simplistic. But Boys Ranch was, uh, was a lot more complex. And the fact, actually, this is from Harvey Comics, it only lasted a few issues, and yet it is still fondly remembered. It's because... Uh, Jack Kirby's dynamic artwork that would later make him make him famous so it's about a little over 10 years after this when he's uh, working for Marvel and they start bringing out all those superheroes. Uh, this is just a, an example, a splash page from an issue of Boys Ranch and uh, uh, you can see that it's a, there's a lot going on and you can see a lot of the signature Jack Kirby style in this image uh, that is harder to find in stuff from 10 years before that. He was experimenting with perspective. And, well, dynamic is the word for, for Jack Kirby's style uh, that uh, had basically gelled by 1950. A lot going on and very, very dramatic. Well, I mentioned when I was talking about the Cisco Kid, the fact that uh, it was a series of movies, and so they tried to make a comic of it in 1944. Then when it became a TV show, 
after the Western boom had started, you know, it, it took off. Well, Westerns took off on television in the 1950s. And Dell was there to, uh, to cash in on this by getting the license to all of the most popular Western television shows. And if you're talking about Western television shows, there were a lot of them. At the height of the popularity of TV Westerns in 1959, there were more than 30 weekly Western TV shows. Now remember, there's only three networks at that time. There was no cable. Uh, so all you had was ABC, NBC, and CBS. And their prime time programming was uh, from 8 to 11 Eastern, 7 to 10 Central, um, seven days a week, although they didn't really uh, invest a lot on Sunday nights. So we're talking about 30-some series is a big chunk. The only thing that comes close to comparing, comparing to it, and it still uh, doesn't really come very close, is by the early 2000s, uh, there were so many police procedural detective shows, different versions of Law and & Order and CSI, uh, and uh, um, NCIS, is that what it is? Anyway, so many different things. It's like all seems like the same thing. That was happening with Westerns back in the 50s. So hopefully you've heard of at least one of these. Um, many of them are still playing in, in syndication. You've got Gunsmoke, which was on for 20 seasons. Longest-running dramatic show with the same cast. Um, Bonanza, Have Gun, Will Travel, Maverick. Rawhide with a young Clint Eastwood, uh, who was in the smaller picture there. So uh, these things were guaranteed sellers. Now we're going to take a brief look at the... Uh, the Western comics of various different companies. And we're going to start with Charlton Comics, who started making Westerns in the 1950s when, uh, when they became a, a larger comics operation and continued doing so long after most companies had stopped. So uh, uh, this one on the far right, Gunfighters, kind of... Uh, lasted through that whole era. It started off in 1956 as Davy Crockett, and then with issue 9 they changed the name to Kid Montana, making it a more um, um, westerny western, and then in 1966 changed it to Gunfighters, and it ran until 1984. And uh, most western comics had disappeared by the late 70s. They also um, had Black Fury, the Wonder Horse. So, a comic book starring the horse. And it wasn't like a talking animal kind of thing. So, other people might have Black Beauty, but by golly, this is a Western, so we'll have Black Fury. Avon Comics, uh, which we've talked about uh, briefly in reference to their horror comics in the uh, late 40s. Uh, they had several Westerns. And uh, they had some famous names. You know, Dell had Roy Rogers and Gene Autry. Avon had some famous names, but they were all people who had been dead more than 75 years, so they didn't have to pay anybody to use them. Over at D.C., there were plenty of uh, recurring Western characters, some of whom we've already talked about when we were discussing Native Americans. You know, Pow Wow Smith there, Fire Hair. On the right, uh, Tomahawk, who's uh, the father of the character Hawk, and he was supposed to be a Davy Crockett type frontiersman. Also, you had uh, a masked Western hero, uh, the uh, Nighthawk, up there in Western comics. You had Johnny Thunder, more of a traditional cowboy star. The Trigger Twins, isn't that cute? Uh, so these characters were long running and they still show up from time to time in the DC universe. You know, if Superman travels through time or whatever, uh, or if there's a big like 
multi-dimensional event that involves space and time. Here they'll here they'll come, uh, and every once in a while, DC will even do uh, a Western comic in which these guys might appear. But um, the characters, the DC characters from the 1970s, have had more staying power. The the Western characters, and that includes Scalp Hunter, whom we've talked about before. And El Diablo, who also appeared in Weird Western Tales. And I almost included El Diablo when we were talking about um, Latinx characters. Um, except for the fact that even though he's a, a Zorro-like masked figure on a black horse, you know, except with bolos instead of, uh, instead of a whip, and even though he has a Spanish name, El Diablo, he's a white guy named Lazarus Lane in the Old West. Uh, he has these mysterious, uh, unearthly powers. Uh, DC updated the character uh, in 1989 and made it into a modern superhero taken over by a... Uh, kind of like, uh, like the Red Wolf thing over at Marvel, right? So the uh, El Diablo powers keep getting passed down. Kind of like Ghost Rider also. Uh, so... The 1989 version, and then the, there's another version that since then, have, they've both been Mexican-American. And that's the, uh, that's the version of El Diablo that was, uh, I think, in the Suicide Squad movie. And then you've got Bat Lash, Bartholomew Lash. Um, the tagline is, will he save the West or ruin it? I think that uh, debuted in 1969. So... Bat Lash is very much kind of like a red-haired imitation of Brett Maverick from the TV show Maverick, in that he's a gambler, a professional gambler, who's good with a gun and with his fists and can fight if he has to, but will go to great lengths to avoid it because he'd rather not. He'd rather not get hit or shot at. He'd rather spend his time with the ladies. So, uh, in that sense, very similar to Maverick. But, just to give it a 1969 twist and make him seem a little bit hip, maybe a little bit hippie, um, he always has a flower in his hat. But, the 1970s DC Western character that uh, rose above all the others was this guy, Jonah Hex co-created by Tony DeZuniga. Um, Jonah Hex, who was, uh, he debuted in Weird Western Tales and got his own, got his own title. Um, a bounty hunter whose uh, one half of his face is hideously scarred. And he is very much in the uh, tradition, not of, you know, the John Wayne type characters or Roy Rogers, more like Clint Eastwood uh, from the uh, spaghetti westerns, uh, the Italian-made uh, uh, westerns of the late 60s and, and 70s, in that, you know, in spaghetti westerns, the hero is an anti-hero. Um, he is amoral. Uh, he's really just trying to make a buck. He sometimes winds up helping people, but, you know, doesn't want to make a habit of it, right? So, uh, still dressed in his uh, Confederate uniform, or at least parts of it, a uh, very, uh, very violent, um, sometimes, sometimes dealing with supernatural subjects. Um, Jonah Hex lasted until 1985. And uh, when it was canceled in 1985, it was the last remaining comic book western. Like I said before, most of them were gone by the late 70s. All the Marvel ones were gone around 1978. I think maybe one of them, Two Gun Kid, may have lasted till 79. And I think the thing that killed Western comics is the same thing that killed Western movies and Western TV shows. Because starting in the late 70s, you didn't see Westerns anymore. They just disappeared. And I think what killed them was Star Wars uh, because it was so popular with kids. And if you think about it, I mean, Han Solo is a gunfighter, right? 
a smuggler and a, and a gunfighter. Anyway, um, Jonah Hex's Western comic book days may have been behind him, at least temporarily, but he was still around in the DC Universe starting in 1986 in a very, I think, uh, ill-conceived move when he gets magically transported into a dystopian future. And a title just called Hex. Uh, their nuclear-ravaged world needed a hero, but what he got was Hex. So he takes his anti-hero bounty-hunting skills into a Mad Max-like future, and that lasted about a year because no one wanted to see Jonah Hex, uh, you know, fighting aliens and robots. In the 90s, there were several Jonah Hex miniseries that uh, uh, arrived to critical acclaim by the critically acclaimed team of Joe R. Lansdale, writer, who actually um, wasn't really a comic book writer, wasn't known as a comic book writer. He is uh, well known as a writer of horror and of... Uh, of mysteries and 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 crime novels, uh, and the uh, the artist, the penciler there was uh, Timothy Truman, who's the uh, guy that uh, created that Scout Native American character. Then in the two thousands, Jonah Hex got his own title back, and it ran for several years. And even when uh, when that one ended. He went right into, the character went right into another series called All-Star Western that ran also for several years. So Jonah Hex has staying power, despite the, uh, speaking of ill-conceived, despite the way they went about making the Jonah Hex movie. Now Josh Brolin was perfect in that role, perfect for that character. And they got kind of the uh, the general feel of it right, but... They changed so much, and they they, they they made it. They tried to make it into a uh, uh, a superhero movie, which Jonah Hex is not. Anyway, uh, over at DC, there was a, another uh, a miniseries in the '90s that was uh, illustrated. Uh, the a penciler was Timothy Truman. The writer was John Ostrander, who's uh, creator of the Suicide Squad called The Kents. It was a 12-part miniseries that basically tells, uh, you can see the Superman logo there, uh, it tells the, uh, the history of uh, Clark Kent's adopted family back in the Old West, right there. He, Smallville is supposed to be in Kansas, right? So throughout the course of this, as we're following the Kents, they meet up with all the DC characters that I just talked about. Over at Marvel, there were a whole lot of Western comics in the 50s. Remember, we looked at that. Uh, then, uh, by the 60s, uh, there were some new characters, um, like Red Wolf in 1970. Ghost Rider, uh, who was originally called Knight Rider. I guess someone may have uh, eventually realized that Knight Riders was another word for the Ku Klux Klan, and having a, a guy on a horse in a mask all white might not be a good idea, and so they changed it to Ghost Rider. Um, there was a one-shot in 1980 uh, in the pages of Marvel premiere called The Coming of Caleb Hammer that was very, very good, and uh, the plan was to make that into a series, but, uh, you know, by then Westerns were passe and it didn't happen, but the character has kept showing up. Uh, in Marvel, in various guises. Of course, the big three were the Rawhide Kid, Kid Colt Outlaw, and the Two-Gun Kid. Uh, Kid Colt Outlaw was extremely popular in the late 40s and into the 50s and 60s, but kind of uh, uh, faded into the background a little bit by the 70s when it was uh, Rawhide Kid and Two-Gun Kid. But if you watched, uh, if you watched the TV show Agent Carter, which was about uh, Peggy Carter, Captain America's girlfriend in the Captain America movie, uh, and her further adventures, then you actually got to see Kid Colt, kind of, because uh, in one scene, one episode, Howard Stark, Tony Stark's dad, Iron Man's dad, is trying to become a movie producer, and he's made a movie out of the popular character Kid Colt, uh, 
who was supposed to be a historical figure. Uh, and so we actually get to see what he would uh, kind of sort of look like in a 1950s TV show. We also got to get a look at the uh, uh, original Ghost Rider, uh, the, the cowboy version, in the movie Ghost Rider, because uh, Sam Elliott, uh, in that one plays actually the the original Ghost Rider. There he is on his horse. Well, um, westerns had a little bit of a comeback, starting in the uh, uh, starting around the turn of this last century, starting around the year two thousand. Um, we saw that Jonah Hex came back right for a long running series over at Marvel uh, in the year two thousand. Uh, John Ostrander, uh, again, uh, had another mini-series called Blaze of Glory, The Last Ride uh, of the Western Heroes, which uh, sort of has this great big huge event where all the major Marvel Western characters come together for one last big gunfight and a bunch of them get killed off. Then, uh, a few years later, Marvel uh, sporadically released uh, uh, other other westerns featuring some of their old characters. Now, in 2002, under the uh, the Max imprint, which was like Marvel's version of Vertigo for mature audiences, the Rawhide Kid appeared in a sequel to Blaze of Glory, and they had changed his look in Blaze of Glory to make him look more like a uh, kind of like a, a Moody's 90s, uh, 1990s Hallmark Western hero. Um, but right after that, so he'd been all changed around in his appearance, and he's all kind of gloomy and moody. In 2003, he appears again in his original outfit in a miniseries called Rawhide Kid Slap Leather. And it was written written by a guy who was new to comic books. Uh, he was a comic and a, a comedian, comic, uh, and a TV writer and frequent uh, guest on the Howard Stern Show, and illustrated by John Severin, the guy that did Rawhide Kid like back in the, the late 40s and 50s. But uh, it was very different. It was played for laughs. And it was presented... Uh, and I really should have uh, talked about this when I was talking about LGBTQ stuff. It was presented that the Rawhide Kid was gay, but it was sort of like the kind of uh, gay representation that those underground comics I talked about in the early 70s, in which it was played for laughs and sort of made fun of the over-exaggerated, uh, lisping, gay stereotypes. Uh, and it showed up, it was on, they were talking about it on CNN. Stan Lee was going around talking about uh, this bold idea. Um, I think that uh, that same kind of storyline and that same thing happening, handled in a different way, uh, I think that might, I think that would have been better, but that's just my opinion. Anyway, uh, it was popular enough that there was a sequel to it a few years later um, by the same guy, Zimmerman, uh, with art by Howard Chaikin, uh, pencils by Chaikin, called uh, Rawhide Kid, The Sensational Seven, that had several of the other Western characters there. We've already talked at length about Lobo from Dell Comics 1965, which featured an African-American hero, African-American Western hero, making Lobo the first African-American character to have their own comic book title, even though it only lasted for two issues for the reasons that we discussed at that time. The, uh, the fact that, that, that basically... Uh, Dell wasn't able to sell any copies in the South. 1972, Marvel uh, released a title called The Gunhawks, or more, more accurately, Reno Jones and Kid Cassidy, The Gunhawks, which was a Western with uh, two heroes, a white guy and a black guy. Now, 
This is kind of a convoluted story. By the way, before I get into the convoluted story, that cover is drawn by Sid Shores, who was uh, one of the first people that came over to Timely slash Marvel Comics when they started doing comics back in 1939. Anyway, um, Kid Cassidy and Reno Jones. This is right after the Civil War, and uh, Kid Cassidy... Uh, was the last surviving member of his family who had owned a plantation and Reno Jones had been their slave. And when the war starts, both of them join the Confederate Army together, which is extremely problematic, ahistorical, and has all kinds of racial issues with with uh, that that scenario. But be that as it may, uh, the, the story begins at the end of the Civil War, and they're wandering the West, trying initially to find Reno Jones' uh, girlfriend, who was, uh, I think, if I remember correctly, she was kidnapped by Yankees, those mean Yankees. Anyway, the, the point is, this is October 1972, not long after uh, Luke Cage, Hero for Hire, debuted. And you've got now this comic where there's two guys, uh, but Reno Jones, the black guy, gets top billing. And then in issue six, Kid Cassidy gets killed off. So beginning with issue seven, it's just called Reno Jones, the Gunhawk. And guess what? There was no issue eight. <laughs> it was canceled abruptly because of bad sales. But nonetheless... That makes Reno Jones the second Marvel character, uh, the second African-American Marvel character to get their own title. Well, uh, that's taking a look at uh, the African-American presence. There wasn't a whole lot of it, but uh, what was there was significant. Uh, let's look briefly at the presence of women in Western comics, and for the most part, they played the same role that women played in uh, crime comics and uh, science fiction comics and most superhero comics, which is kind of uh, a subordinate role as someone to be rescued. But there were exceptions. There were some uh, female heroes in Western comics as well. We've talked about fire hair. Uh, Atlas in the 50s had Annie Oakley, which is an actual real historical person and as such had been dead a long time so they didn't have to pay for the rights. Uh, and DC had a character named Cinnamon who was uh, kind of like the, uh, the junior partner uh, or frequent sidekick of the masked DC hero Nighthawk. And just like El Diablo, DC wound up with an, uh, an Old West version and also a modern day version of that character. And back in 1948, there was even a title called Women Outlaws from Fox Features. Um, this has the distinction of being one of the comic books that Frederick Wortham uh, kind of uh, zoomed in on uh, to show all that was wrong with comic books, in his opinion. Uh, in this case, just uh, the... Uh, the hypersexualized nature of, of the women in this book, and look at all that leg that's being shown, uh, plus the fact that uh, they're women, but they're not nice. Uh, so, uh, moving on and taking a brief look at Hispanic characters, uh, we've, uh, we've mentioned these guys already. The Cisco Kid, who sometimes kind of uh, came off as a, a bad stereotype, but was nonetheless a Latino hero uh, who had uh, his own movies, his own TV show, and his, his own comic book. And, of course, Zorro. And El Diablo, I did put him in here because this is a character that so obviously ought to be Mexican-American that even though it's a white guy, eventually DC kind of threw in the towel on that and made him Mexican-American in the uh, modern version. A lot of... Uh, a lot of Mexican characters showed up in uh, DC Comics as villains. Uh, one of Jonah Hex's recurring villains was a, uh, a Mexican bandito 
named El Papagayo, or the parrot, who was really all the negative Mexican stereotypes that, uh, that one can imagine still in the 1980s. Um, Zorro, the image I keep using isn't from uh, back then, it's from Dynamite Comics from the 2000s because uh, uh, Zorro made a comeback. Dynamite, in fact, um, they have uh, a lot of, uh, they've had a lot of Western titles. They brought back Zorro and the Lone Ranger. They had one uh, uh, title called The Man with No Name based on the Clint Eastwood uh, movies. And Zorro, remember how the Lone Ranger teamed up with a very old Lone Ranger, teamed up with a young Green Hornet? Well, uh, old Zorro over in Dynamite, Dynamite Comics has teamed up with the younger Lone Ranger and also Django from Django Unchained, the Quentin Tarantino movie. And if you'll notice the credits, Quentin Tarantino co-wrote the book. You'll also notice that that one says both Dynamite and Vertigo, which means that this was a joint operation between Dynamite Comics and DC, essentially. That's owned by Warner Brothers, and that's probably how Quentin Tarantino got involved. Well, in the 21st century, uh, a subgenre that has been very popular in both comic books and in other media is Weird Westerns, which... Even the, the, the title of the subgenre gets its name from that DC comic, Weird Western Tales, where Jonah Hex first showed up. So uh, Jonah Hex, uh, usually a, kind of just a straight-out Western, uh, kind of like a play on a spaghetti Western, but sometimes, especially in the, in the 90s, uh, when the horror writer Joe R. Lansdale was writing it, why he might meet zombies or uh, uh, giant prehistoric worms. So several other titles in the 21st century have, have come out. Grave Slinger about a, a Western uh, undertaker that kills zombies. Desperados, which is one of the best, uh, best modern uh, Westerns. Um, Six Gun Gorilla. I just don't even know. Uh, that's actually a, a character from Pulp Fiction from back in the 1930s that had lapsed into the public domain. Um, you just have to read it. Anyway, uh, also I want to talk briefly about the extreme popularity of the Western genre, especially from the uh, 50s, 60s, 70s, uh, and into the 80s, outside the United States. There have been Western comics showing up in, in a lot of other countries and a lot of other uh, languages over the years, including... Uh, these are just some examples of Spanish, uh, Spanish language Western comics, including El Teniente Negro. I'd love to find a copy of that. I want to see what that's all about, the Black Lieutenant. Uh, so Spanish, Italian, French, and uh, speaking of French language Westerns, that brings us to this guy. Blueberry by Mobius. Mobius alias Jean Giraud, who was uh, a Belgian artist who's probably, probably the most highly regarded comic book artist ever worldwide. He's best known for his fantasy artwork and fantasy and science fiction. But he also uh, created one of the most enduring Western characters, Blueberry, which is kind of similar to uh, the uh, Akira Kurosawa Japanese film Yojimbo, in which the, uh, the hero, when asked his name and doesn't want to give it, just kind of looks out uh, and says his name is like Blueberry Bush. Uh, in this case, Blueberry's not his real name. Uh, he was trying to find an, an alias, and uh, that just happens to be what he saw. So that's how he's known. Um, from the 1960s all the way up until the, the 80s, through the 80s, this comic appeared uh, in, in Europe and eventually was translated into English uh, 
in the 1980s. Now you'll notice uh, these are a couple of the English translation covers up here. It's Charlier and Mobius. So Mobius, alias Jean Giraud, was the artist. Michel Charlier uh, was the writer for all these early uh, blueberry strips, which are essentially reprinted in the American translated versions. But later on in the 1970s, uh, Charlier was no longer uh, writing the, the stories. Mobius was doing the whole thing. And, you know, it does it does look kind of strange when when you uh, when you read the original French, which I prefer to read it in the original French. Um, uh, he's stealing my horse, or au voleur mon cheval. And notice that the instead of going pew, French guns go pa. Uh, Viens rechercher toi à l'heure bureau de sheriff. So long, guy. Just kind of sounds weird. Anyway. Um, a few years ago, actually, uh, I guess it was 2011, I, uh, I coordinated a, uh, a survey among a select group of comics historians and comics writers and artists, including uh, John Ostrander and Timothy Truman and uh, some, some other folks. <clears throat> and... Uh, it was basically I, I, I wanted to find out, you know, what everyone's picks were for like the five best um, Western comics characters. And overwhelmingly, number one was Jonah Hex. Blueberry showed up at uh, number five. I put him at number one. Um, I think he's not as well known in the United States, uh, even among comics fans. But... Mobius certainly is, and uh, this is not only extremely well-drawn, but one of the most well-written Western comics series. <laughs>